Today it's time to warp space and time. We're gonna have a Sinnoh showdown, Dialga versus Palkia, but inside of Pokemon Red. The rules are in the description, and the ultimate goal here, as always, is to see which Pokemon can finish the game in the fastest time. Now, this one wasn't originally a versus video, but after spending some time with the Pokemon, it was very clear that they belonged together. So first up, let me just start talking about the difficulty of choosing how to pick between the variables of these Pokemon. They have their original Sinnoh forms, but Legends Arceus introduced their origin forms similar to what Giratina already had. And regardless of if you like the new designs, I'm always just looking for the best version of a Pokemon to use in these runs. And if you want to know, I need to focus on this for a second. I use the Chansey rule, which means that I take the highest stat between special attack and special defense. And that's what I use for the unified generation one special. And if you look at the two stats for Dialga between the regular and the origin forms, the difference is pretty much that the regular Dialga just has 20 extra attack over origin form and there's zero drawbacks. Now if you look over at Palkia there's a little bit of nuance here because origin form has 20 extra speed at the cost of 20 attack but since Palkia already has 100 base speed I think the extra 20 in speed doesn't really do anything and once again the vanilla Sinnoh version just stands out. So now we know why I chose the vanilla versions let's do a direct stat comparison and you can see that these Pokemon are very very similar with two differences. The Alga has 100 HP as opposed to Palkia is 90, but Palkia makes up the difference with 100 speed as opposed to Dialga's 90 base speed. Now Dialga has an extra 20 points in defense, and when you combine the extra HP, the defense, and Dialga's typing, which we'll go into soon, it makes a much bigger difference than you might initially think. Now as for the learn set, I did go with Gen 6 at the end of the day because I had some criteria for what I really wanted these runs to you know, live up to the hype. The number one thing was I wanted to make sure they could deal with Brock, but pretty much virtually every learn set will give you Dragon Breath, so it doesn't really matter. And next, I wanted one of the sets that give you Slash at level 15, and then I wanted to get access of the signature moves before the end of the game, which is usually in that level 52 to 55 range, and Generations 4, 5, and 6 fit that bill. I went with specifically because Power Gym got a little boost in base power starting in that generation. And if you want to know the new moves here, I went with Dragon Breath, Power Gym, Dragon Claw, Flash Cannon, Roar of Time. I did make the mistake of putting Flash Cannon at level 42. That's not right, but I don't even use Flash Cannon, so it doesn't really matter. When we go over to Palkia, the similarities continue. Notice I learned the same moves at pretty much the same levels. The new moves are going to mirror Dialga, Dragon Breath, Power Gym, Dragon Claw, and the signature move Spatial Rend. And to me, it's worth noting that Metal Claw, I could have used Metal Claw on Dialga, but it was pretty bad. I didn't even bother to use it. But for Palkia, I substituted Bubble Beam at a level six over Water Pulse because they're so similar of moves. And I just wanted to save a little bit of time, but that's pretty much the big difference between the Pokemon. I also substituted Earthquake at level 33 in place of Earth Power. Now I'll talk about the toppings and all of that soon, but I don't want to just spend all day with preliminary looks. So let's just cover the first leg of the race. Both Pokemon are going to do the bare minimum here. They're only going to fight the main mandatory bug catcher in Viridian before going directly to Brock. Dialga's up first, and I don't have super effective damage, but since Dragon is special typing in Gen 1, it does more than enough. Now, unfortunately, it does take me like three turns each to beat Brock's Pokemon, so it's not the fastest, but at the end of the day, finishing with a six minute and 20 second Brock split, I think it's something that most Pokemon would kill for. It's not really that big of a deal, but remember, this is a race, and if we look over and swap to Palkia, you're gonna see, we already know, we got Bubble Beam already. It does double super effective damage. I think you know what's going to happen here. That means it's two easy one shots. Palki is already saving some precious seconds here. It's got an early advantage, but things are still pretty close. Moving ahead, the routes are going to follow really similar paths, but since Palkia already has Bubble Beam and Dragon Breath PP reserves, it can just comfortably cruise through Route 3 and Mount Moon, and today we will be buying an escape rope so that we can skip the Mount Moon candy, save us a little bit of time, but let's talk about toppings a little bit more. Palkia is a water and dragon Pokemon, and in terms of Generation 1, this is a perfectly neutral topping. The ice weakness of dragon is negated by the water side, and water's grass and electric weakness are nullified by the dragon side. 
Now being neutral for the entire game seems pretty great. It is pretty good. But what we're going to see is that it doesn't really offer any helpful resistances. And when you combine that with the fact that it already has a lower HP and defense compared to Dialga, I'm going to start taking some chip damage along the way. And over the course of starting the game until I make it to the end of Mount Moon, I'm going to be at just 20 HP. And the trade off that Palkia faces here is that I need to already heal pretty early when I make it to Cerulean just so I can be healthy enough to actually stand a chance against Misty. Now going back to Dialga, it's a Steel Dragon. Dragon type. It does have a couple of weaknesses, but I think if you look deeper in a standard run of Pokemon Red, fighting and ground damage are virtually non-existent. And even if you got hit with like a Machamp submission or a Doug Trio dig, Dialga just has the stats to survive. So for all intents and purposes, Dialga just has nothing to fear in these games. Also keep in mind that I'm not using the Gen 3 steel typing that's grossly overpowered. I'm using modern steel typing. But if you look at this little modified top chart here, you can just get an idea of how great this top combination is. When you look at the stuff that can do neutral damage, Ghost only has Lick. Fire pretty much essentially only has the Blaine fight. Ice is pretty much the same way. It only has Lorelei. Dragon doesn't even have damaging moves because Dragon Rage does fixed damage. And I haven't done the math here, but the resistance to normal topping, it has to be one of the biggest benefits a Pokemon can have in these games because I think like 90% of the battles in the game just use normal moves. The Psychic Resistance is also a huge part. It makes Alakazam trivial and that's just great for one of these runs and I guess at the end of the day how this route Dialga differs from Palkia this early in the game is that I barely take any damage and I can just keep marching through everything just like the Terminator but the key thing here is that I don't have those extra power points that Palkia has access to so I do have to dip into the pre Mount Moon Poke Center I have to get my Dragon Breath PP back but this pretty much means that even without the healing part of that, I would be in much better shape than Palkia. And this means I can skip that initial Cerulean heal. I can go straight to Misty. And now our contestants are pretty much back to being even. We're going to stick with Dialga, and this fight isn't too bad, but this is the only time you're going to hear me say that resisting normal moves hurts us, and it's kind of a bad thing. It will take us several Dragon Breaths to chew through the battle, but the fact that we resist normal and we resist water, it kind of like resets the AI. It means that Starmie, who's already kind of overpowered anyway, can just start to fire off bubble beams all day long, and I actually lose a lot of health here, but all things considered, the catch-up experience is pretty nice. Palkia, on the other hand, double resist water. We take neutral damage from normal moves, and you would think it would be a much easier fight given our stats and our moveset similarities, but things just kind of work out the same. I don't quite get the two hit on Staryu, and it's going to crit me with a tackle, and normally this could cause things to be really close, but Dragon Breath, it does essentially have a body slam paralysis chance. I do get it here on the Starmie. We outpace it, and that's it. We get the second badge. Now the big thing here for both runs is that we get access to Slash at level 15. It's a guaranteed crit move on both Pokemon and they both have 120 base attack. So it's really just a way to mow down little minor speed bumps along the way. Now in general it's not good enough of a move to be in the final learn set but getting it now goes a really long way. And I want you to think about it as like getting an early body slam but instead of getting it on the SSAM we get it right before Nugget Bridge. For rival number two, you cannot one-shot Pidgeotto, but you can two-shot it with pretty much any of your moves. You're also going to outspeed it, so sand attack risk is pretty minimal. But once again, notice that Palkia, it, I take two quick attacks. One of them crits. I'm getting close to half health, and as the fight progresses, Rattata is going to get another quick attack, and I'm already in the yellow health. And this is just already a really good example of Palkia having less bulk, less resistances, and it gets beat up just a little bit along the way. Healing isn't an option, and I just have to keep pressing on. I'm not going to show Dialga because the fight pretty much goes exactly the same and as far as Nugget Bridge goes you guys already know this is a spot in the game this is the spot with the single highest cluster of mandatory battles and luckily for both of these Pokemon we can one shot each and every single one of them so it's as seamless as it can possibly be. I'd also like to take this time to tell you guys that as a dad as a husband as someone who has a lot of things going on besides releasing a Pokemon video once every two weeks I'm also in the thick of my hardest semester of university 
diversity yet. So doing a versus video that takes like three or four times longer than a normal video is not in my best interest, but I think it just needed to be done. Now I don't ever say this anymore, but if you could just take a second, leave a little like, maybe tell me how you feel about these Pokemon, interact with me in any way possible, tell me what legendaries you're excited to see in the future, or even better, subscribe if you want to catch more of these videos. That would be fantastic. And also, if you want to play these versions of yourself, I do offer patch files for my Patreon and channel members if maybe you want an incentive to directly support the channel. But the long and short of it is that I appreciate you guys watching. Now, finding the time to make videos seems like it gets a little bit harder and harder as time goes on, but I'm just, I'm grateful to have any sort of audience at all. But what this comes down to is that I would love to reach 20K subscribers before the year 2027. Let's get it done. Let's continue with the run. Now, the main things to take note of here during this time is that I'll be opting to fight the single Onyx Hiker rather than the Elixir Hiker that most runs would do. It's a little bit faster. And believe it or not, both runs only need a single Elixir for the entire run. And after this battle, both runs will learn Power Gem at level 19. Now in Gen 6 onwards, it has 80 base power. It's already stronger than Rock Slide. And it's a very rare rock move that has 100% accuracy, but spoiler alert, it's pretty much only useful for a single time in the entire game, so it's pretty inconsequential. Moving ahead to a big moment for Palkia's run, you know I usually do three runs to arrive at my final rankings for these videos, and we've talked about Palkia a lot, we've just seen it get beat up a little bit, and the totality of that Rival 2 fight along with some chip damage along the way, it leads to this moment. Now I can easily handle the triple Pidgey Junior Trainer here, but she's going to use Quick Attack a couple of times, one of them's going to crit, and it's going to leave me like in a predicament here, where I can continue to be low and I can just risk the whole run, or I can be a little bit safe, maybe waste a little bit of time and what I'm gonna do here is a completely off script and this isn't really something that's run ending but I do want to talk about it but when I shop here I'm gonna buy a single super potion and use it now the reality is that I can do this entire thing in like three or four seconds but each real life second is like three seconds on the speed that I play the game on so this is roughly like 12 seconds down the drain for Palkia and as we'll see very soon it could very well make the difference in the run on the SSN there's no body slam today and I'm not even gonna pick up the gentleman candy so it's just straight on to rival number three where this is going to be that one singular battle where power gem can save me a little time now everything else is a range or a crit but power gem super effective damage can just one shot pidgeotto outright 100 percent guaranteed it makes it to where this fight is even faster than the last rival fight but now let's get to the real reason that i didn't want to be at 27 health and i chose to buy that super potion Lieutenant Surge is something that normally you don't really put much thought into. In pretty much all of my practice runs, Lieutenant Surge loved to hit Palkia with a crit Thunderbolt and it might just be neutral damage but it still hurts a good bit and I would rather waste like 10 seconds to guarantee that my run didn't end here at Surge so that I wouldn't have to start over because I think being a perfectionist and doing like 29 runs just so everything works out immaculately. I think it's a colossal waste of my time, so I'm buying the Super Potion 9 out of 10 times. Now, we haven't looked at Dialga in a minute, but my comparison to Terminator earlier was it was a good way to describe it. This thing is a defensive monster, and now that we've made up that early PP deficit, it's just clawing its way back in to overcome that little early bubble beam advantage that Palkia had. Now after the battle, it goes without saying that Thunderbolt, it's a move that's it's gonna make the final learn set. It's really good. I haven't mentioned it, but it also goes without saying that these two Pokemon learn every single good TM in the entire game that you would expect from Pokemon of this caliber. It's also time for the first split data of the run. And at this point, you can see that slowly but surely, Dialga has just been a little bit behind. Bubble Beam got Palkia an early 14 second lead. It added a little bit to it after each gym. And now we sit here with a 30 second lead separating our contestants which is pretty close all things considered and as we go on there's one thing that I really want to burn into your brain these Pokemon are extremely similar we've already talked about it they are Gen 4's box art legendaries very similar stats they share mostly the same moves they learn them all at the same levels and what that means is that these Pokemon actually have pretty much identical routes on paper, they are 100% identical routes, but during the heat of the moment, playing the games, I do some things slightly different. But keep that in mind, if you don't see one Pokemon for a while, or I don't cover both Pokemon for a major battle, that's why, because they're pretty much exactly the same. And I don't want you to think that I'm refusing to go in depth. It's just because these Pokemon are so similar and play out the same exact way. 
With all that said, we can just skip over Rock Tunnel. And when we make it to Celadon, I'm immediately gonna go do my buy as soon as I enter town before I do anything else. The only thing that I do here, outside of stocking up on Super Repels, is get Ice Beam, teach it to both Pokemon immediately. Now both Pokemon, they're just gonna slide through the Rocket Hideout after that. No complications to speak of. And after that, they're quickly gonna take on Pokemon Tower. But Erica is where the next check mark on the run is gonna be. And here's where I do some slight deviation to the routing something I didn't really mean to do. Now for whatever reason, I go ahead and I just head down to Fuchsia with the Alga. It's not really a time loss or a time gain, it's just an interesting way to do things. Sometimes I'll forget my notes and I'll start playing on instinct and I'll just do something that I know I have to do anyway. But what I'm trying to say is that this wasn't the original plan. And when we look at Erica, there's really not much to say here. The resistances or the neutral damage in the case of Palkia, it gives you a slight risk with Big True Bell, but you do have like a 30% chance just to one shot it outright. But I don't get it with either Pokemon. I'm also not punished for it. Now it's a fairly easy fight. And I want to talk about the dual type damage misinformation glitch in Gen 1 because it was brought up several times in the Garchomp video. There's a link I'll put in the description from Bulbapedia. It shows the priority order of type effectiveness in Gen 1. It's what the game follows. So Palkia's water and dragon typing obviously makes us only neutral to grass. But in the game code, grass being resisted by dragon is listed near the top of that list. Therefore, the game will display that Victory Bell's Razor Leaf was not very effective. Grass's super effective damage to water is near the bottom of that list. And if you ever wonder why the game says something like Venusaur takes super effective damage from an earthquake despite it being neutral damage, it's because of that list. And the fact that ground being super effective against poison is higher on that list, it gives it priority and that's what the game displays. Now that was a pretty long winded explanation for everything, but I just I wanted to say it. There's some useless information for you to know about Gen 1 games. But let's keep going. Next up is Silphco, and the plan is very, very specific here. And you can see on Dialga, I almost forget, but I backtrack. I really need to fight this juggler here to give me some extra experience because it's such a quick battle. And this is also where I'm gonna pick up that single elixir for the entire run. Now after the card key grunt, I'm gonna hit level 33. I'm gonna replace Dragon Rage with Earthquake. I'm gonna use two rare candies to get up to level 35, and that's gonna help things move in really fast. With Palkia, there's no other way to say it. I just completely forget to fight the juggler and by the time I realized it I was already on the third floor and I knew that backtracking would take too much time so instead I just go ahead and fight the scientist next to rival number five's warp. It does end up costing me a turn or two and I take some damage from a self-destruct so I have to use a full restore but it does allow me to stay on track and in line with the plan because if you think about it I'm using two rare candies and that's going to reset my experience anyway so things just aren't messed up for later. Looking at the rival fight, level 35 was the point that made this fight feel much faster. Now you'll see one shot ranges on virtually everything and just to elaborate just a little bit on why I would delete Dragon Claw and keep Slash is for Alakazam ranges specifically. Earthquake just can't one shot it at 35 and there really isn't anything specific that Dragon Claw does for you but the only thing in this fight is that you can't one shot Blastoise unless you crit so this fight plays out exactly the same for both Pokemon. So now we're done with Silphco, and in a run with a powerful Pokemon that has no setup moves, it doesn't really matter if you have insane stats because there's gonna be a lot of things that you just can't one shot and most of the remaining gems have that issue. And this is why Slash is so important. It's going to allow me to go straight to Sabrina without really sacrificing anything. And the problem for Dialga specifically is that I don't outspeed Kadabra, but I can make short work of most of her team. But even though we resist Psychic, it's a great thing to have Alakazam with a five level advantage still does a lot of damage to us even when it uses side wave but Dialga he gets through it he's on a mission now it's on to the next one the reason I did Koga after Sabrina is because you don't have one shot ranges no matter what now I use Slash to finish off Muck and Weezing because they're going to survive an earthquake and it saves a little bit of power points to last me until near the end of the game but this one's pretty straightforward and we're going to see that with the next few fights they're all really really straightforward that's going to lead us to a brisk swim down to Cinnabar it's that time of the week dipping my toes in the water and the only other thing to talk about is that this week we have the power of space and time I can consult with both Palkia and Dialga and I can determine if TM28 is actually Tombstoner brother or not and it turns out that this is like the one thing in the universe that they can't really seem to figure out so go figure 
Plain, straightforward. Yeah, I use Earthquake. That's usually how it tends to go if you can learn it. Now, Arcanine will likely survive one of them and you have to spend an extra turn, but overall this battle is about as simple as it gets and that leaves us with the final gem. And surprise, surprise, it's another battle that's incredibly simple. All you have to do is go straight Ice Beam, but why I'm highlighting Dialga here is that you can miss ranges in this fight and the one shots aren't 100% guaranteed on some Pokemon. And I'm gonna have to take some extra turns to take out the Nidal Queen and the Nidal King. And I'm not gonna show Palkia, but it did pick up those ranges as as well as something random from a previous mandatory gym trainer. I got like a one shot on the Machoke that's a range as well. But that's the eighth gym down. And now we can get to the meat and potatoes of what made these runs so interesting for me to redo. Now here I'm gonna pop all of my five remaining rare candies. That's gonna get us to level 48. And in the process at level 46, our contestants will finally get access to their signature moves. And I love signature moves. I think they are the most interesting thing about bringing a Pokemon back to these older games. But starting with Dialga here, his signature move is Roar of Time. It's a 150 base power move. And it's essentially just a dragon version of Hyper Beam. That means that it gets stabbed, it hits like a truck. And with Gen 1 mechanics, I'm not gonna have to recharge the turn after if I knock out the Pokemon. Now what this does mean however is that I can't just use it all willy-nilly whenever I want. I have to guarantee that I have the knockout if I want to play it safe and if I want to take some risk with it I need to at least make sure it's like a 50-50 chance I can get the one shot or else I'll end up wasting more turns than I otherwise would have. But with a 225 effective power dragon laser let's look at rival number six. I want you to pay close attention to the battle here to understand the limitations of Roar of Time. I'll use regular moves to get free one shots on the first four Pokemon, but when we get to that Alakazam, I'm going to use Earthquake and it's not a one shot. Now Roar of Time has a pretty bad range here too, but I don't want to waste even more turns if I can help it. And this is like the least amount of turns Dialga can really manage this without relying on crit luck. But at the end, I can also, I can comfortably one shot Blastoise, but the 90% accuracy goes ahead and bots me here. I miss a turn anyway and while this isn't a slow battle by any stretch of the imagination I do lose a few turns and that's gonna lead us to Palkia. Palkia's signature move is Spatial Ren and I don't want to be hyperbolic but if Roar of Time hits like a truck this thing is a tactical nuke. It only has 100 base power it doesn't look like much on the surface but it gets stabbed and what's important is just like Slash it's a high crit rate move and we've already been over it. if you have over 64 base speed in Gen 1 and a high crit move you'll always crit. Now if you look at the move box I do have the crit multiplier the modifier already baked into the effective power here and you can see that it's already at a massive 285 effective power and the long and short of everything I'm trying to say here is where Dialga has these risk and rewards to its special moves and you can only use it in certain situations Palkia can just use this to absolutely murder anything including Alakazam so Palkia it's gonna get through this battle with all one shots and it's gonna be as efficient as you can possibly be on this battle that's going to lead us to one last look at split data and you can see that Dialga just for some reason decided to go down to the Safari Zone before Erica and Palkia had a lead all the way up to there. It bloated all the way to a 4 minute and 20 second lead just because of Dialga doing some stuff out of order. But after that, Dialga started catching some steam and you can see that through the Sabrina, Koga, Blaine, even the Giovanni split, Dialga had the lead. But Palkia getting a little bit more one shots going into that Giovanni split, it made up some time and by the time that we beat rival number six with Spatial Ren getting all those extra one shots, saving turns, Palkia has regained the lead by 33 seconds. And what I'm wondering now, what everybody should be wondering is if Spatial Ren will save that much time in the Elite Four, if we just saw like a preview of what is to come or if it's all gonna kind of even out in the end. It's very, very close, 30 seconds. This one's turning out to be a nail biter. When it comes to making it to the Elite Four, both contestants have already used all their rare candies. We have our final learn sets already prepped up. Neither contestant is weak to ice and they have no glaring weaknesses in the Elite Four, so they should get through it real quick. The question is how quick? And I think we're gonna swap over to Dialga and we're gonna let Dialga go through the whole Elite Four before I come back to Palkia. But without further ado, I think it's time just to take a look. The 
The first thing I want to look at is Dugong. At level 49 here, it's pretty much a 50-50 chance to one-shot it with Roar of Time, and I just don't think it's worth the risk this early. I'd rather go for two Thunderbolts rather than risking three turns with the Roar of Time and the recharging and all that. But I get lucky here and I get the crit, so it's about the best case scenario. Now we're going to knock out the next Pokemon Cloyster really easy with Thunderbolt, and Slowbro is going to be another Pokemon where I don't use Roar of Time because I don't exactly trust the range. There's some risk that I'm willing to take at the end of the run, at the final couple of battles, but not right now. And the only time I'm going to use it during this fight is on Jinx. It is a guaranteed one shot. We can get it out of there. And Lapras will do some pretty heavy damage with Blizzard, but this thing is so tanky that you might as well go two Thunderbolts on it. And you can see that Roar of Time, pretty good move, but we just couldn't let it loose as much as you would like. But it's a pretty clean battle, all things considered. Next up, we got Bruno, Hacker Anthony, whatever you want to call him. This one is really really straightforward. I can Ice Beam the two Onyx, I can Thunderbolt the Hitmons, and we have Roar of Time which is a guaranteed one shot on the Machamp. So we have one shot ranges on everything, we outspeed everything. This one, one and done, very quick battle, not really much to say about it. Kind of what you expect with a good Pokemon against Bruno. Moving straight into Agatha, this one is pretty straightforward. Not quite as easy as Bruno, but we have Earthquakes for all the Poison types. We do have a, I think it's a really high range on the Gold Bat, I don't know the exact number, 86%. So we can get through this one pretty easy. Now the one concession that Dialga had to make here was that I don't outspeed the final Gengar. Now it is going to get me kind of low with the Nightshade. Doesn't really matter too much because I'm going to heal after this anyway. Or probably not even going to heal at all. But it does waste the turn. That's what I'm trying to say. Agatha not really much of a problem. But I do sacrifice a turn here. Lance is pretty much at Bruno levels this week. He's very easy. Uh, we don't outspeed the Aerodactyl but it only has resisted moves so it doesn't really matter. We can Thunderbolt the Gyarados and I can just go straight Ice Beam and get one shots on the rest of the fight. Very simple self-explanatory fight. And it's worth noting that for both Pokemon so I don't have to repeat myself when we get to Palkia is that I haven't used an elixir this entire leap forward. This is after this fight's where we're going to use the one single elixir. I'm going to heal up and go into that champion fight. But let's go ahead and just fade to black. I'll go ahead and do the champion intro for Dialga. We'll take a look at it and then we'll come back to Palkia. When it comes to Pidgeot, you have a pretty decent range with Ice Beam or Thunderbolt, but I go for Roar of Time just to guarantee one shot, get it out of here. And on Alakazam, notice once again, I'm going Earthquake. It's not a one shot. I am out speed, so I'm bleeding a couple of turns here and there, but I just cannot afford to risk the Roar of Time right now. We all know that Alakazam has extremely high special, and it's very, very unlikely that we'll knock it out and we'll just end up wasting more turns. But all things considered, we come out pretty good. Now Rhydon, easy one shot. Arcanine has a really, really high chance of being knocked out with the roar of time but unfortunately it's gonna survive right here which means I'm gonna end up wasting an extra turn and I'm gonna have to finish it off with another move after the recharge so we're bleeding a little bit of time and what these battles usually come down to is executor will it use hypnosis or not because that's the potential to waste the most time two ice beams will get the job done and we get pretty fortunate with a two turn barrage only so we get to take it out and at the end is blastoise and I'm gonna take the risk here I'm gonna roll the dice on about a 50-50 shot to get the one shot. I don't get it. I have to waste that recharge turn. It's going to get a full restore. And I think this was a mistake on my part because I go for Roar of Time again. I roll the dice once again and I get the crit. So it one shots it. No harm, no foul type situation. And that's going to be the end of Dialga's run. That means Dialga is going to finish with a 1 hour, 49 minute, and 3 second time. I'm not going to bring up the tier list just yet, but if all things stood right now, this would be the third place Pokemon. Now, keep in mind that this thing is faster than really, really good Pokemon like Mega Charizard X. This time is outstanding. Dialga put on a master class for this run, and I know what you're thinking. Hey, we still have another Pokemon to look at, and you're exactly right, my friend. But I'm just letting you know that in this moment, Dialga would be the third best Pokemon we've ever run and that this run was really really close to being sub 149 which would have been a pretty amazing run but let's go look at the space chicken When we just take our first look at Lorelai, you'll see immediately that we just spatial ran the Dugong, get an easy one shot, and we're going to end up doing the same. Cloyster doesn't matter. We can spatial ran the Slowbro for a one shot, spatial ran the Jinx for a one shot, and the only thing that's similar to Dialga is that it still takes two Thunderbolts because Lapras is just too bulky, but already we're saving a little bit of time on the first fight. And just to keep this really brief, the Bruno fight goes the exact same way for Palkia, same exact order, and on Agatha, the only difference is that 
that we actually, we have that 10 extra base speed. We actually outspeed the Gengar and we can gain another turn over Dialga, giving us just a little bit of extra speed. And the Lance fight is going to play out exactly the same as well, except we don't resist Aerodactyl's move, so we get hurt quite a good bit, but it doesn't matter because this is a point we're going to use our full restore and elixir anyway, and that's going to lead us to Palkia's champion battle. Now here, I'm just going to go Spatial Ren crazy right off the bat. I can easily one-shot the Pidgeot, and unfortunately, very unfortunate here, the Alakazam is actually going to survive. It's very, very low chance of surviving. This little clown should probably pick up a lottery ticket or something, but it gets a full restore, wastes just a little bit of my time, and from there, I can just go on a tear, one-shot a couple of Pokemon, and always going to come down to that Executor. Will it use Hypnosis? It doesn't. It's going to take two Ice Beams, just like with Dialga, and annoyingly enough, it gets a five-turn stomp which does waste a little bit of time and at the very end we're going to see like a big difference we already seen spatial ram versus roar of time but we can just easily one shot the blastoise at the very end and that marks a very very decisive and quick elite four for palkia So Palkia finishes with a time of 1 hour, 47 minutes, and 43 seconds. Now this time is incredible. I wanted to highlight Dialga just for a second earlier because it would have been a top 3 finish if not for this monster here. I want to bring up the split data just really quickly just to look at this final time real quick. And it's just, it's amazing to me that Spatial Ren made as much of a difference as it is. Being able to get that heavy, heavy damage and just eliminate turns and just save turns here and there. Gave it a 1 minute and 20 seconds decisive victory at the very end meaning that from the start of the elite four until the end of the game we gained about a minute and at the end of the day these pokemon were so similar they were so close for the entire game but it turns out that spatial rend is just like the best move ever and roar of time just could not compete with it this also means that these two pokemon were great i don't want to take anything away from it palkia ended up winning in the end but dialga is really good and if we bring up that tier list we have a shuffle at the top palkia is now the number three pokemon which is really great because nothing can top Mega Mewtwo Y. It's like untouchable and Alolan Ninetales is like an anomaly. It's not a legendary. It's not a mega Pokemon. It's just a beast of a Pokemon and I don't think we're ever going to see a regular Pokemon beat that but Palkia climbing up to third place beating out other mega Pokemon is pretty cool and Dialga you can't take away anything from it because it's number four. There's no shame in being the fourth best Pokemon but I think that's going to do it for me. I don't want to bloat the video too much. I was trying to get like a little like interactive map to work for the videos but after fiddling with it for a while it just takes way too much time but if you made it this far I'd really do appreciate it if you're a real one comment that down below if you're new and you've made it this far and you're not subscribed I do this once every two weeks I'd appreciate the support special shout out to my channel members and patreons I really do appreciate what you guys do for me I'm not really sure what's next I know I eventually want to get to Garatina I already have plans for it but we're inching dangerously close to midterms and like I said earlier this is a really really tough semester for me on top of everything else going on in life but we'll we'll get it done like we always do but thanks for hanging out thanks for watching the video that's really about all I have to say and I guess I'll catch you on the next one bye